Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about the axis of resistance. Vengeance is brewing. Why and how and where is all that going? And our guest for the show is Rupmati Khandrakar, geopolitical analyst. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Hello, Ajay. Thank you for having me. A pleasure is all mine. Educate us about the axis of resistance. It's a it's a funny term. I don't think a lot of people know about it or have thought about it. Resistance against what? And who's involved? And why is there an axis? Yeah, Jay, this is a word which has come up very, very vehemently in international politics. It's the axis of resistance. So this is the network, a military network of militia groups, resistant groups which are in the Middle East supported by Iran and its Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corp, the IRGC. Now, Jay, this comprises uh, uh, overall of Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Syrian official armed forces, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, Palestine Islamic Jihad in Gaza and West Bank, militia in Iraq, and the Houthi uh, in Yemen. Now, this is a broad uh, aspect of who are the who comprise in the axis of resistance? So you can see they are all terrorists. They are all militant. They are all uh, focused on uh, one uh, mission, and we'll we'll make out. It's very evident, but we'll play it out through the episode. So Jay, let's take it a little uh, backward and say when U.S. President George Bush coined the term as axis of evil, he was meaning to say Iraq under Saddam Hussein, Iran, and South North Korea. So this was his axis of evil. In in response to that, this axis of resistance has come up, and this uh, in this uh, axis, Jay, these groups act independently. Uh, they are motivated by their own self interest, but they have a coordinated uh, thread which binds together their training, their funding, their activities. You know, there is a common ground that they share. So uh, their larger aim is to thwart uh, Israel, the US, and Saudi Arabia in the regional balance of power in the Middle East. Be Saudi Arabia because it's led by Iran. So Iran's main rival in the Middle East is, uh, regional power is Saudi Arabia. So Jay, this network uh, balances this uh, militant goals with this coordinated aspect of funding and getting uh, arms. And Jay, these seeds of resistance were actually planted in the second half of the Lebanese civil war. Now, this happened in 1975 to 1990, the Lebanese civil war. And this axis of resistance, Jay, uh, we can see that by June 1982, both Israel and uh, Syria were fighting in the southern half of Lebanon. And that is when you had that uh, in Iran also of the Islamic revolution in 1979, they had these Shiite clerics who took over. So they saw an opportunity where they could counter Israel in this. So Jay, by 1985, you see that uh, this Iranian-backed uh, uh, militia in Lebanon has come coalesced into Hezbollah. So uh, Jay, after the civil war, uh, you see Hezbollah has surpassed the official Lebanese army and turned into the predominant armed force the largest social, uh, shows, um, social welfare network and the most powerful political party. So three things at one time. So Hezbollah took over, like actually took over Lebanon. And uh, we see that Hassan, Hassan Nasrullah has been commanding uh, uh, Hezbollah from 1992 to ab about now when he was assassinated in 2024. He was the main interlocutor and coordinator for this axis of resistance today. Secondly, Jay, the developments that happened was the toppling of Saddam Hussein by the same militia, Shia militia, uh, uh, when Saddam Hussein was toppled, had the rise of the uh, Shia militia in Iraq. Now, this helps uh, Iran to get a more, uh, you know, stronghold in Iraq, which is, they are, they are Shia and uh, Iraq was Sunni. After Saddam Hussein, it became the Shia militia which came into the forefront. So the Shia-Sunni divide plays very acutely in this uh, this chain. So Iraq war from 2003 to 2011, Iran has aided 
uh, openly this militia in Iraq, the Shia militia. So now, Jay, what happened is after the Iraq war, they had territorial contiguity from Iran to Lebanon, including militia in southern Iraq, Syrian government, and Hezbollah. So uh, you have these, uh, this circuit which operates and as a unit. Jay. So technically, it is an axis of resistance and it was called the Shia Crescent. Uh, and this term was coined by Jordan's King Abdullah in 20, 2004. So, uh, Jay, it was, um, for an example, Jay, during the Israel-Hamas war in October 23, this Khattar Hezbollah was the one which was targeting U.S.-based uh, um, units uh, during this war. So, in um, 2019, this Khatayib Hezbollah had targeted uh, the uh, Iraqi base housing for U.S. soldiers. You remember that one? That's how they came into uh, uh, prominence. They were part of the popular mobilist uh, forces, Jay. The PMF, as they are called. So, this axis of resistance, Jay, you see them operating very, very well. When there was the terrorist attack on October 7, 2023, Hamas, the PMF, and the militia groups all attacked Israel at the same time. Hezbollah and Houthi also have acted in solidarity with uh, these, uh, these, this axis of resistance. And Jay, when uh, we have examples, blatant examples. While Haniya was killed, he was attending the ceremony of the Tehran um, of the Iranian president so in Iran. Uh, Nasrullah's assassination in Lebanon was met with an Iranian uh, attack of around 180 ballistic missiles. And on the anniversary of October 7th recently, Hamas and Hezbollah and Houthi forces have all fired rockets into Israel. So the unity of the axis of resistance is what makes this axis dangerous in international politics, contemporary international politics. I understand that the axis of resistance isn't really resistance at all. It's, and I don't know if I would agree with George Bush about using the term evil, but it's an axis of aggression, in my view, an aggression against Israel, only against Israel. I mean, you know, if the people of Iran and these proxies spent a little time developing their economies, developing tourism, um, opening opening their borders, opening their their hearts and minds to people from far away, you'd have a different kind of Middle East. But what you have is this this commitment to the river and the sea, destroying Jews, destroying Israel, destroying America very clearly. And so that would be an underlying point of the axis of resistance hyphen axis of aggression. But I, I have another question for you. Why? Why do they care so much about this? It is extremely negative. By, by any standard in any religion, it is violent. Um, it is mean, mean-spirited. It is uh, misogynistic. It is all the wrong things. And yet, it's very popular. And yet, the people of Iran essentially, mostly, support it. And the government of Iran supports it. And the people in the in the proxy organizations obviously support it, maybe because they get money and weapons and a little attention and notoriety and so forth. But the big question to me is why is all this, why all this anti-Semitism, why all, you know, uh, this anti-Israel thing? Uh, let me point out to you that in the year 1900, there were millions of Jews living all around the Middle East in every country you've named. And they were free to practice their religion. They were free to do business and have families and lives. But somewhere, probably on the eve of World War II, um, these Arab countries began forcing them out. And um, as a result, now there are no Jews in any of these countries. You can't live there. You can't do business there. Even if they find out that you, you know, you your passport has a stamp to Israel, they will take mm. steps against you. Um, if they know you're Jewish or Israeli, you stand a good chance of of being arrested, imprisoned, and prosecuted for who knows what. 
Um, so the Jews that were there that contributed to the, um, the robust quality, to the extent there was one, of the Middle East back, back when are gone and it been completely replaced. And, and I suggest to you, they're being increasingly replaced by this viral uh, Shia violent movement. What, what is behind that? Why do that? You could, you could actually do much better, but they don't. Jay, theology, uh, the whole uh, crux of the problem is uh, fanatism. There is a uh, underlying streak of megalomaniac uh, qualities in the leadership of these uh, nations who are part of this axis of resistance. And Jay, that megalomaniac streak runs in their domestic population also. Because a few days back, you saw how many uh, Iranian people were donating jewelry to the government to get together in the war against Israel. So this kind of uh, jingoistic uh, propaganda that happens, happens at a very large scale. In our, con our uh, societies, Jay, in any um, the TV, if uh, television, if we have too much of uh, things happening in our year. So we don't get influenced too much. We have a kind of a balanced view. If you, if this is wrong, it's wrong or right. But for them, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. It is who stands against my brother of my own religion. That is the problem, Jay. The unity that they show, you've seen the tweet of uh, Ali Khamenei. Uh, it is on the backdrop of missiles and saying that he will, it was nobody from, no leadership of Israel said that they will wipe Iran off the map. But the leadership of Israel of Iran said that they will wipe Israel off the map. So categorically, in uh, written on stone, written in black ink, written on your computer screen, everywhere you can see it, they want the country to be wiped off. So their goal is very, very uh, uh, fanatic and it's very disorienting because they have... Uh, destruction on their mind and to get to those means there is such a big sunni shia divide Jay. the iraq iran war was termed as a mad mad war. seven years eight years they keep on continuously fighting but if your enemy is israel they will unite they will forget their internal divisions and their uh, you know their um, their differences just to unite against israel after israel they come back to fighting amongst themselves so that's the issue, Jay. They forget and they move ahead. Amongst our societies, we have 10 hundred other things to do before we, we move on to unity of religion. Religion takes um, a seat which is um, 10 times uh, less in priority than our other daily work. But for them, if you ask them, do you want a daily bread or do you want to protect your own brother? They will protect their own brother of their own religion. It's um, very... Uh, uh, what do you say, straight, Jay, that when it comes to religion, today Ali Khomeini stands and unites each person on the basis of religion. He talks of countries across to unite against the atrocities on Muslims in countries like uh, in uh, Gaza, uh, you know, Palestine, Syria, um, what do you say, um, India, all day. they name everything. <laughs> they don't leave uh, any country and they just talk about protecting the Muslim right. How many uh, papers or how many leaders you can see that will tell protect the Christians or protect the Jews? How many? Israel is the only one who's trying to protect. We want to do self-defense. They are not saying they want to attack anybody. They are the victims. But today they are playing the retaliatory game. Not a day passes when there are no missiles, no now ballistic missiles being Hostages still not returned. So they, they indulge in the lowest level of warfare. There are no rules to be followed. Now, Russia and Ukraine have prisoners of war dealing among so much of bickering on the international stage. Still, UAE could come in and negotiate a term in which prisoners of war were exchanged between Russia and Ukraine. So that is a sign of two civilized societies in a war. But today we are still searching for hostages of Israeli hostages, whether they are in the tunnels, whether they are sold, whether they are dead. So this is a very hard hitting today that we have um, two wars going on, but at different levels. This is at the lowest level that Israel can 
uh, work on. They have the other side does not have any morale. They don't have any limitations. They don't have an aspect of humanity left in them. They want to, if the Iron Dome was not there, if David Sling was not there, <laughs> if the Arms Force was not there, Israel would have been destroyed over and over and over again. It is Israel's ability to uh, and uh, will to survive that is existing. Otherwise, these countries want to just destroy and J leave alone this. After, if they fulfill this, they are not going to keep quiet because I've told you, Islam is the only only religion in the world with political agenda. After this, they move on to the next target. And we have seen how Torah Bora is the uh, genesis of uh, Al-Qaeda. So you have a bombing in, uh, in the city of New York. So something like that can come up from anywhere. So fanatism has to be destroyed by each and every person at each and every level. Certainly, uh, you know, events bear this out. But you mentioned um, this very strange relationship between the, the Shias and the Sunnis. You know, it used to be, in the case of uh, Iran's uh, long war uh, with Iraq, that, the, that you, you had two religions fighting with each other. But now it doesn't sound that way. Because, you know, the people in Hamas are actually Sunni, not Shia. Uh, and yet, Iran is friendly and uses Hamas as a proxy, even though they're different religions. And I, I take your point that, um, you know, the enemy of my enemy is, <laughs> how does that work? The, 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 the enemy of my enemy is my friend or something along those lines. Um, and so as long as uh, Hamas is attacking Israel, they're a good proxy. And it doesn't matter, I guess, um, that they're Sunni instead of Shia. Uh, and, and, that, and that may be the case with some of these other proxies, too. What the question that comes to mind, though, is um, Iran is a big country. Iran has an economy. And even now, it, it could have a much better economy, honestly. But it doesn't care to do that. It cares to engage in this, this uh, aggression. But there are countries out there, not too far away, who support Iran's um, movement its axis of resistance or um, aggression. One of them is Turkey. One of them is Russia. Why is this? What is, what is happening with these countries that, that like to support Iran, even though it's obvious that Iran is a rogue nation? Um, why does Russia support Iran? Uh, why does it have the strange relationship? And the same with Turkey. Russia, uh, Russia is whoever's siding, uh, America siding, Russia will go on the opposite side. It's the balance of power that they uh, seek. And if they would have also supported Israel, there's no space, accommodating space for this power. So they try to go over there. Uh, supporting Iran, uh, supporting Syria, they think that they can form a uh, uh, coalition when they need it. Uh, you know, they have these long-term goals. They think that it might be Cold War uh, time again, you know, when you have two uh, um, competing uh, factions. And that's why Russia keeps these small, small allies around. And Iran and Russia are bordering states. We have to understand that also. They are bordering states. They have issues with the Caspian Sea. They have issues with the uh, so many other uh, fuel issues, you know, uh, all these trade. When Iran was under sanctions, it has kept his dealings with Russia on. Uh, and uh, Jay, this uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE, see how they have used their oil money into benefits for their country. They want their economy to succeed. Have they interfered into this uh, uh, conflict of Hamas? They have not. They've tried to keep themselves away from the Palestine issue as much as possible because right now they are on, on a path of development. They know that oil money may not be the future um, currency or you know future back backing for the economy so they're trying to get into manufacturing trade they're in onto better things and uh, if you see iran it's a big country but the clerics have the concentration of money power and they dictate by uh, the book or the religious book theological society so to keep the uh, population as a submissive is their main aim if they had democracy if they had uh, 
it's a it's a, a pseudo democracy they show that there's the president is elected nothing of that sort happens the the religious leader knows who he wants to hand pick as their leader so it's not the people who choose their leader so all this is uh, it's a fake society ji it's never a, a working democracy or uh, like we see it or like we imagine it to be they want the population to be uh, suppressed so hard that they don't have capacity to raise their voices because we know the clerics have come into power through a revolution so they know a revolution can topple them off so they try their level best to keep any kind of revolution underground so you have on the music industry it's underground you want um, alcohol uh, uh, fuel society it's underground you want your scarves removed it's underground everything that happens in iran is two way one that happens above the surface and one that happens underground so uh, and the iranian people have adjusted to, to that kind of a dual life so who are we to comment from outside <laughs> and uh, uh, they have so much money because of the oil reserves i think uh, iran is one of the largest uh, producers holders of oil so for them dearth of money is never going to be a problem iran has oil so does russia so it's yeah. not as if iran needs to buy oil from russia iran has its own oil um so there's no there's no benefit in that at the same time iran makes these what is it the shaheen missiles um yes. And it sends these missiles and drones, whatever it's making, to Russia for Russia to use against Ukraine. So it's supporting Russia. Um, I guess um, may, maybe it makes some money selling these things to Russia. But what is what is the connection here? Is it just one autocrat to a theocrat? Um, what 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 brings them? What marries them so closely? And the same question as far as uh, Erdogan is concerned in Turkey. What what marries them so closely? What is it that people like those people, like like Putin, like Erdogan, um, that they uh, want to support uh, autocracy, which is another way of saying, um, you know, a religious autocracy? Um, what is it that brings them so close? Is it just that they hate Israel altogether? Is it just that they hate the U.S. altogether? Um, what is happening in a larger sense here? to bring these countries together on the same path, supporting the same mission. You uh, got it right, Jay, uh, that they, they have come together so well. Uh, maybe it's because of the geographical proximity. They're in the same region, they're neighbors. And to be together is their own, because they have sanctions happening all the time. Russia is playing the card between to be a European nation or an Asian nation. You usually don't count Russia into Asia, but if you look at the map, it's all across Asia. So it's more a Asian nation than a, a European nation. But Russia likes to call itself a European nation. When it can't get into this uh, Western Europe mode of uh, existence, Jay, it then plays the card of being the dominant power in Eurasia. So uh, in uh, um, geopolitical terms, Jay, it's trying to play the mini hegemon in this region. And for that, it needs Iran, which is a, a big power and uh, um, Jay, because of uh, produce of oil, its geographical extent, it's one of the largest uh, nations over there. The ability of that regime to say yes to Putin, the yes tactic is what pleases Putin, Jay. They are the yes men of uh, Putin. They don't resist Putin. That is, I think, it, uh, ego massage <laughs> for Putin. And he enjoys this <laughs> uh, with Erdogan and all these people. <laughs> well, I want to I ask you about where this is all going. Um, but the first, the first part of that is to look at the United States and foreign policy. And for this, again, again, and, and always, I want to make you the uh, Secretary of State. Okay. You know, we, we kind of have bungled the, the Middle East. We've tried so often uh, to make peace there, to deal, to deal with these, um, you know, aggressing, aggressor nations. But we haven't succeeded, and it gets worse under our feet all the time. And, it, and, and we make, you know, silly moves. Like, for example, and this is a Trump move, to have Jared Kushner go in there uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia and get a $2 million loan, which is really... The two million dollar line your pocket money 
um, and uh, you know, just keep it and do what you want with it. And, and then for that, you get political favors, but that doesn't help solve the problem in the Middle East at all. Um, and so it, it seems to me that you know the United States, over you know many administrations, but especially the Trump administration, has bungled um, possible relations with the Middle East. I mean, what needs to happen is there needs to be an enlightenment, enlightenment, a general enlightenment in the Middle East. I mean, talk about uh, making America great again. How about making the Middle East great again? Right now, it's falling into an abyss, uh, clearly all the time, every day. So as Secretary of State, Umari, I, I know this is a hard question. Uh, what would you do to improve on American American foreign policy? See, our foreign policy is, uh, what do you say? It's futuristic in a sense, but it kind of, we bungled up on the economic sanctions when uh, we saw that these people could bypass it. And now the de-dollarization happening, Saudi Arabia coming into de-dollarize, the currency coming into the, uh, but we are still part of the G20. Uh, the corridor that will happen, it will be a, a global corridor. And that is where we have to cash in on and folk try to get the Middle East to focus on economics. You know, it's some type of globalization that has to come. Globalization previously was about political. Uh, the more it was had a more political aspect to it, opening up your borders, tariffs. Uh, but this time, the globalization has to be concentrating on economic uh, um, exchanges. Instead of putting sanctions on Russia or this one, North Korea, try to come in and uh, you know entangle them so much into trade. It could reform a theocratic uh, inclined society uh, nation like Saudi Arabia into concentrating on economics. So it can happen with any small country around here. And if you have prosperity uh, uh, civilians, uh, they will want the governments to work. They will want uh, people to, con uh, the nation, go nation's governments to concentrate on economics rather than, you know, political bickering. We can call this axis of resistance as politically motivated economics. So this, kind of globalization is what we have to work towards. And it's not going to be immediately, it's going to be five years, 10 years into the future that you have to, you know, you have to build a financial architecture, which is uh, not like the IMF, which will give you, uh, which will put a debt trap or debt restructuring uh, happening and, you know, make crunching the uh, countries for money. It has to be a more open, independent. When you interlock economically, Jay, it's very difficult to entangle out. When you have exports and imports happening, you want it to happen. Now, the Ukraine-Russia war, they are the bread baskets. Who came in? The UN, they created a green corridor, let the bread basket move, you know. So that kind of, so much of dependence on your economics will create a more peaceful Middle East. Jay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But I am sorry. In fact, you're not Secretary of State. And, <laughs> and, and I feel certain that you wouldn't be Secretary of State if Trump won the election next week. And so I ask you my, my Charles Dickens. Dickens writes about the ghost of Christmas future. And so we have to look at the dark side here. We have to say that the U.S. does not engage in effective foreign policy to enlighten and create, uh, you know, economic economic uh, enlightenment in, in the Middle East, and especially with regard to Iran and, and those other Arab countries. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say it continues the way it's going. Let's say um, we support Israel, but maybe not to the extent that Israel wants. Um, let's say uh, that um, the, um, the Shias take over the Sunnis and you have uh, expansion of theocracy by violence. Let's say um, it, it sort of comes together under Iran with help from some other autocracies. Um, let's say we have the ghost of Christmas future. How does this work? How does this affect the Middle East? How does it affect Israel? How does it affect the United States? How does it affect Europe? You remember there was a free trade um, uh agreement of uh, amongst Latin America and America. 
So, so many times we have said that you don't attend because you are not democratically elected. You are not democratically elected. Like these small issues which happen, all of them have, have to be blurred, Jay. All these uh, notions that which we have have to be blurred. But I can tell you in all um, these happenings, Jay, existential um, priority of Israel is such a must, whether you think of any other thing, the existential priority of Israel is up right up here. It can never ever go down for America because it's not only an ally, it's, uh, it's a religion, it's a civilization which is living, a living civilization which is fighting for survival. And Jay, uh, it's fighting for survival in a place which is uh, in a, against religion 1300 years back and it's conquered by sword. So now they're trying to do the same thing again. So if we see into the future, we want to see a very strong, vibrant Israel, which is indulging more in trade, uh, you know, with uh, other countries. And you have these other, other nations, <laughs> which, which also are now away from this axis of resistance. They are not part of this axis of resistance. And the theological... Uh, society of Iran can well continue to be within Iran. They can enjoy themselves within their borders, but not uh, spill out into um, uh, their venom into the uh, outer countries because because of their crooked uh, aims and objectives. Jay, we have this uh, war which is happening in Israel against four seven fronts. Israel, if did not have to face the axis of resistance, they could have just faced Hamas and move on. So. Uh, in the future, just see a good, vibrant Israel thriving. And uh, Jay, um, <laughs> what do you say? It has to be this and nothing else. So there is no compromise situation on this, Jay. <laughs> you know, but if you look deeply into the dark, into the, um, the future, you wonder whether this is something that is only... That, that can only be resolved with violence. That oh. at the end of the day, um, these people are sworn to destroy Israel, and Israel is not likely to agree to that. <laughs> Israel, Israel, fight back, and hopefully the U.S. and and Europe will help Israel fight back. But it just sounds like we are on the verge of a larger war, and uh, <laughs> whatever happens here, you know this this is the ghost of the of Christmas future. And, and and for that matter, we have the ghost of Christmas future operating in Ukraine and Europe, where Putin wants more territory. He's an aggressor too. He's got his own access of aggression. And you have Europe, which is, um, you know, uh, in my view, increasingly fragmented. Um, and you have violence going on in Ukraine, which seems to be moving west. So yes. there's another war. And sometimes wars connect. You know, World War One is a perfect example of wars that were not necessarily related, all of a sudden connecting. So yeah. in, in the ghost of Christmas future, Rupmati, how likely is it that we will have a larger war in the Middle East and for that matter, a larger war in Europe? Yeah, we won't have a larger war, I feel, because diplomacy has gone to such an extent that they come on one table, they discuss everything, they have this uh, rhetoric which is uh, blasted out and then they to their own countries and try to get them into track. They just have selfish motives on the international stage. First, it was let me uh, let me die for you, my friend. But now it is you go ahead. I will be supporting you from behind. It's nothing of that that they will come out to support. They have just it is just taken a backseat. This kind of coming forward to help your person. Now we have a, we have two different wars zones and they're fighting for two years everybody's watching nobody's helping nobody's doing it. they want to sell their weapons they want to give uh, they, they want to take the exports imports so you have so many selfish motives happening this didn't connect you have uh, dealing with mass immigration you have uh, them dealing with you know their economy is failing you have governments changing from right to left left to right to center so all these things are so uh, they become so self-centered and individualistic or, you know, concentrated at one time. So these two wars are not merging. And we have no 
extra fronts happening on any places. No, uh, now this axis of resistance is one country with these militia. No countries together. Egypt has not come in. Egypt will send, you know, a few uh, funding or, you know, some militia. Jordan is not taking the Palestine refugees. So each one is uh, individualistic and selfish in this global world. Jay. They are not wanting to fall into this trap. And Jay, this is a modern day David and Goliath uh, thing playing out, isn't it? We are fighting mm -hmm. seven friends at one time, seven friends. And while all this happens, you know, all the things that you and I have talked about over months, um, climate change inexorably uh, undermines oh. the quality of life on our planet. If these people spend a little more time dealing with climate change and greenhouse gas and all that, uh, we'd all be better off. Not only, you know, the economy of Iran, but Iran's efforts and Russia's efforts and you know, the efforts of all these people who are fighting, 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 why, why, don't, why don't they spend a little time dealing with climate change? It's getting worse all the time. That's just my overarching reaction, Rupmati. Rupmati <laughs> Kandekar, geopolitical analyst, thank you so much for educating us about the axis of resistance, aka axis of aggression. Thank you so much, Rupmati. Hello, Ajay. Thank you very much.